so now we know that uh, the characteristics like uh, size and uh, interface between the precipitate and matrix they change uh, with aging time okay so now what we are going to do we are going to try to understand how the these changes in the characteristic uh, are going to affect the way dislocations interact with the precipitate okay so let's try to understand that so dislocations can interact with the precipitate in two ways. Okay. The first one is dislocations can cut or say share the precipitates okay and the second one is it can bypass the precipitate okay or we call it say bowing bowing around of dislocations Okay. We also call sometimes as bypassing. I'm going to explain each of these okay, one by one. And uh, depending upon whether the dislocations are cutting or sharing the precipitate or bowing around uh, of dislocations, the interactions, uh, the strength of the material or say in this case, we are talking about focusing on aluminum alloys, the strength of aluminum alloys is going to change okay so let's talk about the first one the sharing or cutting of the precipitate okay sharing of precipitates Okay, so the name itself suggests that you have a precipitate, okay, and the dislocation is coming, okay, and it cuts or it shares the precipitate. Okay, it's like you have a watermelon and you have a knife and you're cutting it. So you can imagine something like that. Okay, so suppose you have a dislocation. So this is your dislocation line. And you have a precipitate, let me change the color. Okay, so you have this precipitate here and you have dislocation. So this is your precipitate. And this is your dislocation. Okay, so dislocation is moving on its slip plane. It finds a precipitate there. Okay, now it, uh, I have already mentioned, now it can do two things. It can either cut it or it can bypass it. Okay, the dislocation can bypass it. Right now we are talking about cutting of the precipitate. Okay, so when it interacts, when it cuts it, the precipitate is going to be something like this. something like this. So it is going to create two new surfaces. Okay, so it is going to cut. So this is cutting. After cutting. So it has cut the precipitate. Okay. So I have the schematic also. So this is how the schematic looks like. So you have a slip plane here. So this is your slip plane for that particular dislocation. 
and this is your half plane uh, and this particular line the blue line here is your dislocation line and Berger vector is also shown in red right and uh, the circle here the sphere here is your precipitate so this one is your precipitate this guy here okay so now the dislocation is moving on its slip plane you can see in the bottom one here dislocation is moving the slip plane it as soon as it reaches to the precipitate it cuts it okay this is after cutting okay and this i have taken from professor anand subramaniam's lecture note uh, he is a professor at iit kanpur okay so this is how dislocation is going to cut the precipitate now uh, So there are six properties of the particle which can affect the way a dislocation uh, interact or in this case uh, precipitation can be shared. Okay, let's try to understand those. So six properties. Of the particle or precipitate. affect the ease at which it can be shared okay so what are those six properties the first one is coherency strain And this one we have already studied before, isn't it? So in the coherency strain, as I mentioned before, that whenever you have a coherent interface, you are going to have some amount of strain associated with it, right? Now a dislocation moves on a slip plane, it comes near to the precipitate, dislocation already have a strain field associated with it. Now you have coherency strain associated with the mat, uh, uh, precipitate, isn't it? So these two strain fields are going to interact. Okay, so coherency strain is there. Second one is stacking fault energy. So if there is a significant difference between the stacking fault of uh, uh, particle or precipitate and the matrix, right? So the local variation of the fault width uh, uh, will um, uh, will affect the interaction between the dislocation and the precipitate. So that is the second factor. Now the third is order structure. So the, if the uh, precipitate has an order structure and typically most of the precipitates are going to have some uh, sort of uh, order structures, especially AL2CU uh, and other precipitates, right? They, they, are, uh, they are going to have order structures. So if they have order structures and dislocation, uh, you know, share them, then you are going to introduce anti-phase boundaries, okay? And that will also try to enhance the strength. Now the fourth one is modulus effect. Now if the precipitate and the matrix uh, 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 both have different uh, modulus, right? 
and the dislo remember the dislocation energy is also associated with the modulus right so if dislocation moves from the matrix to the precipitate and it shares it it is going to change the energy of the dislocation isn't it so that will also require some some amount of energy it might decrease or increase okay but there will be change in the energy of the dislocation isn't it so that is the fourth effect the fifth is interfacial energy now if you see uh, what i showed before so you are going to create new interfaces here right now the creation of these new interfaces uh, will also require some amount of extra energy so it will also enhance the strength okay so that is what when i wrote uh, interface energy that is what i mean okay so uh, creation of uh, in new interfaces will require extra amount of energy and the last one is lattice friction stress so both matrix and the precipitate both are going to have their internal frictional stresses right like your pearls stress okay so when a dislocation moves from the matrix to the uh, precipitate and try tries to shares it right so you are going to uh, dislocation is going to observe different friction stresses okay so these are the six points or six properties of the precipitate which can affect uh, uh, by which uh, by the way a dislocation is sharing the precipitate okay now i have listed uh, the uh, formula uh, related to all these effect this is taken by the book of deter from the book of deter okay so like tolerance strain you have a factor of uh, epsilon here so this is your tolerance strain and if you see all of these properties are depending upon uh, the radius radius of the precipitate okay so overall if you see uh, you can go through this uh, formula it is it is standard and it is given in all the books but you know there might be some variations in terms of the constant etc otherwise the uh, concept remains the same okay so overall cutting or shearing of the precipitates will be preferred when the precipitate is coherent and small in size so dislocation will try to cut the precipitate when it is smaller in size and the interface is coherent okay so overall the dislocation will prefer to shear or cut the precipitate when it is small in size and the interface between precipitate and matrix is coherent so it has to be smaller in size and torrent interface okay so if a dislocation is moving on the slip plane 
it finds a precipitate, right? The dislocation will prefer to cut it or share it if the precipitate size is small and the interface is torrid. Okay. Now, if the pre precipitate side becomes larger and larger, and that is what we also discussed before, isn't it? That with respect to time, the precipitate size is going to increase. So after a certain amount of time, the precipitate size will be larger. And now the dislocation will find it very difficult to cut because the stress required to cut the precipitate will be higher if the radius is higher. Okay, so typically the stress required to share the precipitate varies proportional to root r. Okay, so if the uh, radius is higher, stress is for cutting the precipitate is also going to be higher. So after you know some amount of time, your precipitate size is large enough that dislocation will find it to cut it. Now what to do? Now the second option is there. The instead of cutting dislocation is will try to bypass the precipitate or there will be bowing of the dislocation. Okay. So the second option is bypassing, right? Bypassing the precipitates. Or bowing of dislocations. Okay. So when precipitate size is too large, to be shared, then dislocations find a way to move around. Move around the precipitates. Okay. So if the size is very large, okay, dislocation will find it difficult to cut it because the stress is proportional to root r. So it is going to bypass the precipitate. And how does it do it? So let's see it. So suppose you have two precipitate, something like this. And then you have a dislocation which is moving under the applied stress of tau. Okay, this is your dislocation. Okay, now after some time it is going to close near to the precipitate and then it has to bypass it, right? So it is, it, what it will do is since it cannot cut it, it will bow around the precipitate. Okay. So let me first draw the precipitates so that I can show the sequence. Okay, so all these are your precipitates. Now let me move the dislocations here. So as soon as it reaches to it, it is going to go, going to be something like this. Okay. So this is say situation number one, situation number two, where dislocation is bowing, okay? Now what will happen? After some time, it will bow more. So situation is going to be something like this. 
Okay. Now, if you see the dislocation line vector direction is going to be this way, isn't it? So, see the direction of arrow. Okay. So, now at these two points, this point here, this point here, similarly, this point here and this point here. Okay, the direction of dislocation line vector is opposite, isn't it? So what is going to happen? They are going to annihilate. Okay, so finally, what you are going to have a loop of dislocation because these two sessions here. So these two sessions, right? This point, let me change the color now. So this particular point and this point, they are going to annihilate. Similarly, these two points of the dislocation vector, uh, they are going to annihilate, okay? And finally, they are going to leave a loop around the precipitate, and then this dislocation will move forward, okay? So you have now generated two loops, one, this one here, and another one here, okay? So see, you have now learned a way of generating more number of dislocations also. So you had one dislocation, which uh, was moving on the slip plane, and then it observes two precipitates, which are of larger size. It cannot, uh, can, cannot cut them. So it bows around the precipitate. And by doing that, it also generates new number of uh, dislocations, more number of dislocations. Okay, so you have learned a new method of generation of dislocations. Okay, so overall, if I write under applied stress tau, okay, the dislocation. bows in between the particle, right? You can see it, number two here, sequence number two, between the precipitates, okay? And after that, the uh, what is going to happen? The segment of dislocations with opposite direction, they are going to annihilate, right? So the segments of dislocation with opposite direction right or opposite line vector. cancel each other, right? And by doing that, they form a new loop, right? So dislocation loops. Okay, so uh, if the particle size, precipitate size is larger, dislocations are going to bow around the precipitate. And if it is smaller, then the dislocation is going to cut through the precipitate, right? Now, as far as the stress is concerned, stress can be given as two alpha GB by uh, say lambda, where lambda is the distance between the two particles or precipitate. So if you have one and second precipitate here, so this distance, 
okay so if this is lambda so this the stress increment in the stress for bowing the dislocation will be given as 2 alpha gb by lambda where lambda is the interparticle distance or spacing okay so overall here if i want to write similar to what i wrote in the cutting of the precipitate so overall i can write that bowing around of dislocations will be preferred when the dislocation sorry not the dislocation when the precipitate size size is large okay so uh, if the precipitate size is small dislocation is going to cut if it is large it is going to bypass dislocation is going to bypass so now let's combine both of them and try to understand how the shear stress this delta uh, tau right or tau is going to vary with respect to size of the precipitate which is somewhat related to the aging time also right because if we increase the aging time the size of the precipitate is going to increase okay so let me draw so here we have tau okay shear stress and then uh, in on the s axis we have particle radius a precipitate radius say r now now we know that if we increase the precipitate size particle size your uh, uh, stress required to shear the precipitate is going to increase okay so let me draw it so something like this okay so this black curve dotted curve will belong to cutting of precipitates okay now let me draw another one corresponding to the uh, bowing of dislocation okay bypassing the precipitate right so that is going to vary something like this okay because the bowing of uh, dislocation around the precipitate is inversely proportional to r because as we increase the r the distance between the particle or precipitate is going to reduce okay oh sorry it's going to increase okay so overall the strength the stress required to bow in the dislocation uh, around the precipitate is also going to reduce okay so now let if i combine these two my net curve is going to look something like this okay so the blue one here is for bowing of dislocations and the final red one is the net curve 
and the maximum here will correspond to a radius. Let's say we call this radius as RC or critical radius. Okay. So below the critical radius, now if you see this curve, our overall curve is now the red one. Okay. So below the critical radius, we have cutting of precipitates. Okay. And above the critical radius, the bowing of this location is going to be dominant mechanism. Okay. So the mechanism changes with respect to radius. So uh, with, this, with aging time, the radius of the precipitate or precipitate size is increasing. As soon as it reaches to a particular radius, say here in this, this critical radius, your mechanism is going to change from cutting of the precipitate to bowing around the precipitate. Okay, And at the critical radius, both mechanisms are going to be active together, isn't it? Okay, so this is how the strength of a material is dependent upon the parti uh, particle radius or precipitate size. Okay. So we can write here that uh, as precipitate size increases, you know, there will be increment in the sharing stress. Okay. Now, second, we can write a critical radius RC it's reached when both, right? Both are comparable for so cutting as well as bowing. When bowing is comparable to that of sharing. This means both will be active. Both mechanisms will be active. And after this, after uh, it reaches to critical radius, you have only bowing, right? Bowing of dislocations dominant. Okay, so this is how the characteristics of precipitate size and interface will determine the sh shear stress required. Okay, so it changes with respect to size of the precipitate. Okay. So now let's come to something called aging curve, uh, which typically uh, you know, all experiments will try uh, to find out when we talk about the aging behavior of aluminum alloy or precipitation strengthening in aluminum alloy. Okay, so let's understand what is aging curve. 
okay so what we do here we plot hardness versus aging time okay now we know uh, that uh, with respect to aging time the size of the precipitate is going to change and that will also lead to the changing in the shear stress required okay so here we are going to plot the hardness of the sample with respect to time okay and uh, how do we do the experiment so what we do we take number of samples suppose i want to do the same experiment for uh, aluminum 4% proper and i want to generate the curve so let's say aluminum 4 weight percent proper we are taking this particular alloy and i want to generate the aging curve for this alloy so what i am going to do i am going to cut the alloy in small small samples number of samples and i am going to put all the samples together in the furnace okay artificial aging we are doing okay so uh, the first step is solution treatment so we will go to high temperature make it single phase okay all the samples together and then uh, we will quench it Okay, all the samples we are going to quench one by one, and then we will go. We are going to place all the samples together in another furnace, which will be maintained at a lower temperature, say T two. We have discussed what T two is, right? To perform the aging treatment. Okay, now for all, uh, we have kept all the samples. Now after some amount of time, we will take out one sample, say T one, then another sample at T two, another sample at T three, and so on. and then for each sample we are going to measure the hardness of that particular sample in that way what we are going to get is something like this so we are going to plot time on the x axis then here we are going to have hardness on the y axis and this is aging time here okay so we are going to have one hardness at time t equal to 0 that means after quenching we have not started aging yet for that particular sample okay now another sample we have taken out from the uh, uh, furnace say at t1 and we obtain one hardness value which will be say here then at t2 we are obtain another hardness value here then t3 here and so on we are going to get number of data points isn't it something like this okay now if i join this particular line the curve is going to look similar to what we just learned about the variation of shear stress with respect to particle size and this particular curve is known as aging curve okay and now why do we aging call it aging curve right because we are keeping the sample at a particular temperature for long time okay so it's like aging okay with age we also age the sample is also going to age okay that's why this whole phenomena is also called age hardening with respect to age the material is hardened okay so we call it age hardening and this particular curve here is called aging curve okay so this hardness the maximum so remember the curve is similar to what we just saw for shear stress versus the particle size okay so now let me draw it again and then i will mark these regions separately so aging time hardness and then your curve is going to look something like this okay now this particular point where it is zero the only contribution of towards the hardness will be from the lattice stress as well as solid solution strengthening and we'll discuss it eventually 
okay solid solution is remaining because we have not formed any uh, precipitate but this is a condition uh, if you remember it is super saturated solid solution so you have lots of solutes present in the uh, matrix okay so if i uh, talk about aluminum 4% proper you have lots of proper in aluminum matrix and because of those solutes you are going to have some amount of hardness right and that will be called uh, solid solution strengthening so we will come to that particular point and after this particular point your strength uh, hardness is going to increase because of the formation of precipitates and at a high uh, some uh, time here your hardness is maximum okay and this particular condition if i take this particular uh, any alloy and age it to this particular time here okay this particular time that particular condition of the alloy is called peak age condition so the highest hardness corresponds to peak age condition okay so this particular condition is peak age and name itself suggests isn't it peak age peak peak of so uh, see it as a valley okay mountain not valley mountain right so the peak of the mountain so this is called peak age condition now below peak age we have under age so this whole region here will be called under age you have a condition which is under age it has not reached to peak age level yet above peak age if we uh, age the sample to a uh, time which is more than the peak age condition time we call it over aged okay so you have aged more than what is required in in that sense if i imagine right so it is more than the peak age so you have over aged the sample okay so we have three conditions over aged peak aged and under aged and the highest hardness will correspond to the peak age condition now if i take aluminum 4% proper i already mentioned before the sequence of the precipitation is going to be alpha will be then gp jones then you have theta double prime to theta prime to theta and if i try to mark all these precipitates in the aging curve where these precipitates are forming i can say that the gp jones will be somewhere here then theta double prime will be in this regime theta prime here and then over aged will be mostly theta equilibrium condition and theta will be much much larger in size okay so the shape is again similar to the what we just discussed about the shear stress versus precipitate size okay and remember there is a correlation between aging time and precipitate size also so as aging time increases precipitate size also increases so your stress is going to increase so hardness is also going to increase that means in this particular region here up to this point you are going to have sharing of the precipitate will be dominant okay and after that after it has reached to peak age both sharing and bowing will be comparable okay both will be active and after that uh, in the over age condition your bowing of the dislocation will be dominant mechanism okay so this is how the aging curve looks like now we have discussed about the uh, or uh, temperature right uh, effect of aging time 
but what is the effect of temperature we also need to know about it right so till now whatever we have discussed is for a particular temperature so the plot why what i have just shown the aging curve is for a particular temperature so what happens when we change the temperature if we increase the temperature what will happen to peat age hardness whether it will move left side whether it will decrease or increase or similarly what will be the effect on the uh, time okay peat a, a time to reach the peat hardness whether it will also decrease or increase so next we are going to talk about that concept